Okay, um, my name is Richard Bargett. I'm here in the Faculty of Life Sciences at the University of Manchester. And my area of expertise is the study of soil. Now I've been given a whole range of different questions from people about soils, quite a broad range of topics, but I'm gonna start by looking at one question, which was, I recently discovered that there is a lot of bare rock in Yosemite because a lot of mountains there are still relatively young. Roughly how long will it take for soil to accumulate and cover them completely? Well, the first thing to say is that in terms of Yosemite, I can't really answer the question in terms of how fast soils develop in that particular area, because the rate of soil formation varies tremendously dependent on a whole range of environmental factors. So for example, the climate will have a big impact. So in warm, moist environments, soil formation tends to be very rapid compared to in cold environments, but also things like topography, uh, vegetation, and also the climate, as I've already mentioned, can play a major role. But in general, if you were able to sort of average across all the different soils around the world, the rate of soil formation tends to be about 0.1 millimeter per year. So in other words, it takes about 10,000 years to form a soil of around one meter depth. Now, obviously that varies tremendously from place to place, but in general, that's about the normal rate of soil formation. I think the frightening thing is that the actual rates of soil loss through erosion, for example, under intensive agriculture, can be much more rapid than the rate of soil formation. So it takes literally thousands of years to soils form, but we can lose them in a very short amount of time. The next question I'm going to ask is sort of related to soil formation, but it is what is the difference between soil and sand? Well, basically sand is really a textural class of the soil. Soil is made up of organic matter mixed with mineral materials. So that could be clay, silt, or also sand. So you can get soils that have a very high amount of sand within them. And some very immature soils, for example, on sand dunes, for example, could also have very high concentrations or amounts of sand. But to be a soil, I think the key thing is that there are horizons, are layers within the soil, and also that there is organic material intermixed with the mineral components. So soils can form quite rapidly, for example, on the sand dune system, but if it's just pure sand with no plants growing in it, that's not a soil in my mind, but it needs to also have the intermixing of organic material. The next question which I've been asked to answer, which I can probably answer very quickly, is that plants get their nutrients from the soil, but could humans eat soil and survive on the same nutrients? Well, I think it would be quite dangerous to think that you could survive on eating the soil. Obviously, there are lots of nutrients, proteins, for example, and carbon within the actual soil, but you'd have to eat a hell of a lot of soil to actually get those nutrients out. So I suspect you'd probably suffocate or you'd die from clogging your system with clay and other minerals before you got sufficient nutrition. Also, I just can't really imagine that people would want to eat soil. I mean, I think a slight lick or taste of soil is fine and um, there could be sort of vitamins, for example, in that soil, but it, I can't imagine somehow that people would really want to move towards eating soil. So I would say um, that no, I don't think they can. The next question I've got here is very much close to my own research, which is how many individual organisms are there in a handful of soil and how many different species might there be? Well, some people would estimate that the soil contains as much as about 25% of all living diversity on Earth, but it's largely unexplored. So if you took a handful of soil, the sort of general estimates that you might expect is that there could be literally billions of individual bacterial cells within that handful of soil. There could be hundreds of kilometers of fungal material. Fungi produce hyphae or strands of material, and there could be literally hundreds of kilometers within that handful of soil. But there'll also be lots of other animals, protozoa, for example, nematodes, microarthropods, and there could be thousands of individuals within that handful and perhaps hundreds or tens of species of animals within that soil. So in other words, there is a vast diversity of organisms within that soil. Now recently there was actually a study done within New York in Central Park where people looked at all the bi microorganisms living within that soil environment and they found about 122 different bacterial species and around 43 thousand fungal species within Central Park within 
New York City. But the astonishing thing about that is that that was almost all the species of soil organisms, microorganisms, that have been recorded around the world. So even within a very small area of land, I think it's about three and a half kilometers square Central Park, you can find a major portion of the diversity of organisms on Earth within the soil. Okay, so just two more questions. The first is, what effect does removing weeds in my garden have on soil? And what about adding manure? Well, the first thing is manure is absolutely central to soil fertility. Soil fertility depends on the recycling of organic matter or the input of organic matter into the soil, which basically fuels all the organisms that I've talked about previously, but also it binds the soil together, creating soil physical structure, and it also holds moisture within the soil. So organic matter is absolutely crucial to the fertility of soil. And one of the reasons why a lot of gardens, uh, allotments for example, are so fertile is because large amounts of manure and organic material are added to the soil as compost, but also as manure. Now, in terms of what happens if you remove weeds, is it really sort of depends on which weeds you're talking about. If you're just gonna leave soil bare, to me that's not a particularly good thing to do, but obviously some weeds will have beneficial effects on soils, depending on what those plants actually do. For example, if they're nitrogen fixers, they could actually put nitrogen into the system. But it really depends, in my mind, on what species of weeds you're talking about. And I guess in a garden, it would depend more, I think, about those weeds, how they affected the plants that you want to grow around them rather than it affects the soil. I think the key to a fertile soil is replenishing the nutrients that are taken out by the plants and ensuring that the organic matter levels in the soil are high so that it can fuel the diversity of organisms I mentioned before. Okay, so the final question, which I've got here, it was recently discovered that there are around three trillion trees on the planet Earth, about eight times more than previously thought. The question is, how do we get this wrong, this number wrong, and does this offer hope for mitigating climate change? Well, I can't really answer the question about how we got this wrong because it's not an area of research that I'm involved in, but I know there was a paper recently published by some colleagues of mine who actually came up with this value and they use various approaches to come to that assessment. So I guess this is just a reflection of people using different approaches to measure things that had been measured previously. But I think in terms of climate mitigation, I think the key thing is that trees obviously do play a major role in climate mitigation. They absorb carbon dioxide and they actually store carbon dioxide within their biomass. So they play a major role in terms of the global carbon cycle. But I think one thing to bear in mind is that how they affect the carbon cycle depends very much also on how they influence the soil. So in some situations, for example, if you plant land with trees, say young seedlings, it can actually have a negative effect on the amount of carbon contained in the soil because those tree roots can stimulate microbial activity in the soil, breaking down the organic matter, leading to its release to the environment. But in general, Mature forests, for example, and uh, more natural ecosystems play an absolutely crucial role in the mitigation of climate change around the world. And obviously, expansion of forests, for example, in those areas and these sort of figures play a significant role. In some incidences, probiotics can help, but the ones that we can buy over the counter may not always be the right ones to do. So. I think use them, but don't expect them to be miracle workers. So we've got two related questions here. What do you think about the idea that we are too clean? And is there an evolutionary reason for the high prevalence of allergies or are they caused by the modern environment? And these things are actually a bit linked, even though they may not sound that they're linked.